everyone. Um, I'm Haley Bowden, and I'm going to uh, get us started on our afternoon session. So first off, we have uh, Diane Salim from uh, Rutgers University. And go ahead. All right, cool. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Diane. Um, I'm working with Blakesley Burkhoff and our collaborator, David Sondak. Um, and I'm here to tell you about uh, a physics-informed model to increase the resolution of turbulent simulations that we've um, been working with. So just coming out of a whirlwind tour of Blakesley's group's talk, maybe we don't need so much of introduction of why turbulence is so important in uh, astronomical phenomena. Um, but just to reiterate, uh, turbulence is um, such an important phenomena in very big things in astronomy, such as the intercluster medium, like what Blakesley and Megan were talking about, to galaxies, um, to the clouds within the galaxies that form stars, such as that um, Sabrina was talking about. Um, and turbulence is uh, scale-free because it is characterized by a cascade of energy from uh, large scales to small scales. And so that, that's why it's really important to learn about this phenomena so we could tie together the physics of um, uh, all these different scaled uh, things in space. So I'm sure we're all here because we're really excited about machine learning and um, data science and wanting to um, use machine learning for our uh, astronomical objects. But I'm also here today to tell you why turbulence is great for machine learning um, and uh, provides us insight uh, of um, how uh, how physically realistic the outputs of um, these machines are. Um, so since turbulence is characterized by this cascade of energy from large scales to small scales, um, it has a lot of very robust statistical properties. Um, one of the most famous ones, and one I will be talking about, um, of which is called the power spectrum, which shows you how much energy is uh, locked inside each uh, spatial frequency of um, of the system. And so, for example, here, here is a very high resolution um, simulation of a turbulent uh, box uh, run by Christoph Federer and its corresponding um, power spectra, where um, this is the larger spatial frequencies and this is the smaller spatial frequencies. Um, and this, this is a very high resolution simulation at about 4,000 Q. Uh, however, resolution is really uh, important when considering these simulations and analyzing these simulations uh, because uh, a decrease in resolution can, um, can artificially reduce your, um, your numerical, um, can artificially reduce the, uh, the perceived inertial range of, um, of your turbulent system. And why this is important is that you're not going to be able to uh, understand what's um, what the dissipation uh, scale is. And so you won't really know what's happening uh, at the smaller scales. Um, and also uh, up here in, um, in the slopes, uh, we can see that as the inertial range is minimized, the slope of this power spectrum is also um, varied. So different theories um, like to uh, different theories suggest different slopes. So we won't really know what the actual physics of the system um, is representing if we don't if we don't have a solid understanding of um, its whole power spectra. And so because uh, of uh, this uh, statistical property uh, or these statistical um, tools that we have for turbulence, we can use these as an independent measure uh, to see how how physically Ah, so in this study, our goal mapping function between a low resolution turbulent simulation and that of a high resolution turbulent simulation. And um, hopefully by using some uh, physics informed constraints here that I'll talk about, um, we can uh, constrain the output of um, this model to have a more physically realistic um, prediction. And so the backbone of uh, the backbone of this uh, this um, work that we're doing is based on a previous work called Mesh Free Flow Net, which was um, which was studied in twenty or created in twenty twenty by a group by, led by Zhang et al. 
Um, and so the backbone of this of this network is something called a convolutional neural net. Um, and what these uh, and these these uh, kinds of networks are very very good at um, picking out uh, image features in um, image features and image patterns in large uh, large um, image based data sets. And so the first um, the first um, uh, CNN that the data gets passed through is that the low resolution input is passed through a standard uh, convolutional neural network architecture called a UNet in which the input and output are the same dimensions. And uh, within these like uh, upscaling and downscaling convolutions, um, that's where uh, image features are quote unquote learned by this network. And so since the intermediate um, array is the same dimension as the input low resolution, it's convolved once again to get a um, high resolution output. And um, the data from this, um, this cube or like this array uh, goes through two streams. So um, the data here is sampled randomly um, and then uh, and then it's number one, um, directly compared against the um, data points from the original direct numerical simulation um, to, to get a mean squared error loss to see how um, closely the, the um, numbers replicate um, the direct image. Um, and the boundary points are also evaluated to see how well the boundary conditions are um, satisfied. Um, and what's very special about this network is also that these particular points are passed through a, a separate um, a separate neural net branch, which is um, called uh, machine learning perceptron, and is um, and is good for uh, one one D um, kind of data. Um, and here, the PD the partial differential equations of the system can be evaluated, and so um, the degree to which uh, the, these partial differential equations can be evaluated also get, tells you um, or gives you insight into how well uh, the, the output of this machine is performing um, realistically or how close it models physical systems. And so I just like to um, highlight that in, oh, sorry. And um, yeah, so the total loss uh, considered here is a sum of these three losses, uh, the main being, um, the main uh, consideration being that of the uh, image loss, but also with contributions um, by the boundary loss and the equation loss. Um, and I just like to highlight that uh, this work um, includes the boundary loss and incorporates uh, more equations than the um, the work that was it was based on. And so the physical system that we'd like to try to um, to use on this network is called Rayleigh-Bernard convection. Um, and we chose convection because it's a really important, um, really important phenomena in many, many systems. Um, everywhere there's going to be things that are different temperatures and so there's going to be heat transport. And so this particular type of convection is characterized by two parallel plates and the plates are at different um, temperatures and it's under the influence of gravity and they're separated by some distance h. And because of the difference in temperature, there's going to be some buoyancy um, force induced. And therefore, the fluid is going to start moving around. And eventually, if there's enough energy, leads to some turbulent flows. And um, this kind of um, convection is characterized by a dimensionless number called the Rayleigh number, which is um, the, um, the ratio between the time scale for um, thermal transport via diffusion to convection. And it's very synonymous to the Reynolds number. Um, so in, in, in other turbulent studies. So the higher the Rayleigh number, the more turbulent um, a system is. Um, it's also characterized by the Prandtl number, which is a, um, another dimensionless quantity. That's the ratio of um, viscous to um, uh, kinetic kinetic to thermal diffusivity, but that's kept constant in our study. And so the hydrodynamical equations that govern these systems are the Navier-Stokes, the incompressible condition, and the um, or also known as mass conservation, and 
energy conservation. So now the simulation training set that we used to create our data um, was simulated using a framework called Daedalus um, that was first uh, presented by Keaton Burns et al. in 2020. And um, we, were, we ran a suite of simulations from uh, non-turbulent, um, which is 10 to the 6, um, or Rayleigh numbers of 10 to the 6, to very turbulent, which is um, Rayleigh numbers of 10 to the 10. And this is important because the previous study, which we are basing our, um, our work on, uh, only considered um, uh, non non turbulent simulations of really 10 to the 6, um, whereas uh, our simulations cover a broader range of um, like vertical heat transport here, and so it gets to like more turbulent regimes. Um, uh, we also um, yeah, so this is what the the um, oscillatory or um, non turbulent system looks like. And here um, at the very high Rayleigh numbers, uh, we can see that there's much um, much more smaller scales uh, and and much more chaotic flows. Um, and so from this statistically, we only consider um, uh, data that that we see ranges the statistically steady state. Um, so we take we take our images from from this um, subset to make our um, training set. And so now I'd like to show you some of the results of, um, of passing this network of th these, these data into the aforementioned network. And so first I will show you the, um, the output of um, the non-turbulent system. And so it's, I guess it's a little bit hard to see on the, on the screen right now, but if we zoom in um, really close, we could see that um, the, the predictions, the super result predictions of um, non-turbulent flow results in these really strange, um, clearly artificial uh, high, high frequency features, uh, which we know are not anything um, realistic or physical. However, once we look at the, um, the, uh, the output of the very turbulent system, uh, we could see that whilst um, it doesn't capture all of the very small scale res um, small scales in the system, it, um, this this very artificial feature is not present. So there's less of a systematic um, error uh, in the output, and this um, and this can be quantified even more by looking at the power spectra of these um, of these uh, temperature fields, for example. And so here I'm plotting the power spectra of um, the ground truth direct numerical simulations in the pink and the power spectra of the super resolve prediction in the green. And we can see in the non-turbulent case, um, there's a very clear spike in, um, in energy at the very low frequencies, which um, we know is not realistic. Uh, however, when we look at the um, power spectrum, power spectra of the um, very turbulent systems, we see that um, the power spectra is better recreated. Uh, the statistics of the turbulent systems are better recreated. Um, and the scale of these two plots are not the same, which is why they don't look, this doesn't look as, as close together as this one. But we've also, um, uh, we've also applied linear fits onto the onto the slope of the power spectrum within the inertial range. And we see that if we take the difference between the um, slope of the ground truth and the super result fits, our uh, super result predictions, um, we see that um, here's, the, here's the data point for the very non-turbulence case. And, um, and, oh, sorry. And we see that the, um, the super resolved um, field uh, over overestimates the amount of energy, um, which is why it's going down here. Uh, whereas the um, highly turbulent points all show the more um, the the result that makes sense, which is the super resolved um, prediction has shows um, lesser small scales. So 
Um, so it has, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, okay, thanks. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, the higher Rayleigh number, the more turbulent, the more turbulent um, systems um, underestimate the um, amount of small scales a little in the, the energy in the small scales a little bit, but um, it makes more sense because there's not a very obvious um, artificial feature in the power spectra. And this is also further emphasized by the fact that um, the difference, like the, the absolute magnitude of the difference between the, um, the ground truth fits and the super resolve fits are much less in the turbulent systems. And so we see there's um, more agreement um, for these systems than the non-turbulent systems. So in summary, we've been able to expand a convolutional neural net based and physics informed model for super resolution of uh, turbulent simulations. And um, our contribution to this work is that we optimized the architecture. We expanded the training suite that was investigated to include both non-turbulent and turbulent systems. And we've also employed uh, turbulent statistics, um, the turbulent statistics of the power spectrum to quantify um, the realism of uh, the predictions produced by the, the models. And we've seen that this model is able to reproduce the statistics of um, highly turbulent systems better than that of non-turbulent systems. And so some next steps to go forward with this project are um, we'd like to apply this to uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulations, which are more characteristic of the interstellar medium um, and star formation phenomena. And um, also uh, in incorporate more architectural features such as um, incorporating losses that take into account the Fourier spectrum or um, do some sampling to make sure that a broad range of spatial frequencies are um, included in the training set and um, maybe even create a model to predict a higher, um, a, predict a, uh, an image that is of a higher resolution than that that it was trained on just based on the learned statistics turbulent flows that was shown. Um, and also, we'd also like to investigate potentially more statistical diagnostics and how um, they work on, um, on these machine learned simulations, such as those highlighted in Burkhart 2021. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, please email me or come talk to me for the rest of the week. Thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, question. It's obviously a naive question, but do you know, if you go back to your plot, maybe two slides, do you know why you do better for turbulent than non for turbulent regime? Uh, we haven't like quantified exactly why, but we have some, um, we have some speculations about it. So number one, we think that um, if I go back to like say yeah, this, this, this plot say, um, we see that um, the highly turbulent system exhibits a broader range of um, space features that span a broader range of spatial frequencies. So in, um, in oh, sorry, for example, in the non-turbulent case, um, only large scales are shown, uh, whereas in the turbulent case, um, it resolves down to um, very small eddies. So we think because the neural net was um, an image-based uh, machine, it could pick up on these small scale features a little bit better. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Uh, so I'm Hao Wen Zhang, um, and my question is, so when you're trying to use neural network to basically emulate the like high resolution simulations, because um, here when you're like trying to tackle the very turbulent system, for example, there is some discrepancy between the actual simulation and your em emulated result, right? So um, to what extent do you expect, so, um, at I guess, at, at what point do you want to stop and say, okay, this is a good enough emulator, um, given all these discrepancies? Or in other words, like, um, what's the maximum discrepancy that you can accept uh, for this emulator to be a good working one before you stop improving it? 
Oh, I, okay. I think I understand your question. I think um, uh, converge, uh, some kind of convergence would be, um, uh, you know, pointing towards like the maximum, the maximum or the best resolution we can, um, we can resolve. And so, for example, that didn't really make sense, but um, for example, okay, if we um, look at look at the difference between the um, the ground truth uh, slope and the super resolved slope, we see as we increase um, the Rayleigh number, we could see that it seems like this 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 relation is starting to come to a convergence. And so maybe um, like those those scales are like the only uh, the maximum the minimum scales you could reproduce. But we could also um, say that if if this um, relation does indeed reach conversion, convergence, sorry, um, we could come up with perhaps a correction factor um, to correct for to like um, like translate or to map to map the ground truth simulation, the super resolved prediction to the actual ground truth simulation. Okay, thanks. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Very interesting. Um, I was Pablo from Montreal. Um, I'm curious about two things. One of them, how, how do you train on like a single simulation or do you need like multiple simulations to train? Okay, I'm um, sorry. I think I did not uh, explain. Oops. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay. So the simulation is run um, for some some amount of time. And uh, so then we have like a 3D array, meaning like X, Y at time, right? Um, uh, and then and then we take the subset, which is um, in the statistically steady state. And then this subset is random, uh, is sampled at random times. And then um, at those random times, these snapshots um, in like some delta X, delta Y and delta T are taken. Um, and that becomes the training set. So it's not given, it's, it, at no time does it see the entire simulation um, or like see like this, it sees like these little, little, little chunks. Right, but you only need one simulation, I guess, too. Yes. That, that's cool. Yeah. So, but the only issue, I guess, would be that you need to store a lot of snapshots to train this of a very high resolution. I think that's cool. Um, and I was also curious, so you mentioned you have a unit to, uh, in the training. What's the other step? What What is the bit that goes from the low to the high resolution? Like the one that goes from the latent context grid to the high res? Is that just like an oh, MLP or? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a um, a standard upscale con convolution. So same same as what is happening in these steps here. Yeah. Okay, great. That's very interesting. Thank you. Hey, uh, Yuan Sun Ting from, from ANU. Uh, a great work. Um, I just have a question. It's is for, is for, is following the same question here because like, when you do the upscaling, in principle, it's a, a probabilistic like, process. And here, of course, you are just like doing a deterministic mapping. And of course, this also leads to the question that if you just do a deterministic mapping, the mean like, might not be the MAP, right? So if you, if you have a posterior that is like by models, uh, if you do not do a probabilistic mapping, the the major mass of the posterior might not be realized, and uh, this might also explain in some like regime you do not do like, like very well. So I wonder like is like, any plan to make this more um, add some web variational like a, la a layer in order to sample the posterior? Like, does that make sense? I, yes, I, I, I can also eat that. Did you, was that a suggestion or a question? Or, or your thoughts? Like, it, oh, so the so question is like, like, is there like variation or minus something that is not? Is there a what, sorry? It, a like, what, sorry? Like, like is this a probabilistic mapping or a deterministic oh. mapping? No, 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 yeah. We don't take any um statistics within the oh. intermediate intermediate stages of training. We all, all the statistics we've applied in our study is all post post processing. Okay. But yeah, I think it would be really interesting to right. like delve into the statistics of like yeah. whilst it's training. Yeah, yeah, you might also explain like the, some of the, the discrepancy there. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, it'd be great to talk to you okay. to see how, how like you could like assess that like yeah. class training on the go. Oh, cool. Right, thank you so much.
Great. Any more questions? Okay, let's go ahead and thank Diane again.